Hey folks, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. Hope you're doing good. Hope you're kicking ass and taking names. Today, my guest is Matt Fulcher. Matt is a member of London Fire Brigade in the UK and owner of the Fitness Brigade. Now, I know what you're thinking. Fitness Brigade is an awesome name and it matches him as well because Matt has got a really rich history of setbacks, of effort, perseverance and mindset. Today, Matt speaks about his challenges in falling in love with the fire service at a very young age and navigating his way through the expectations of others to finally find himself in the job that he loves and utilizing his passions for personal development, both physical and mental, to begin his business, The Fitness Brigade. We share some fantastic fundamentals around training, around strength, around functional fitness, around nutrition, around mindset, around rest, recovery, sleep. There is so many nuggets to be taken away from today's episode. It's gonna be a good one. You picked a great day to show up. Today, we are privileged to be sponsored by Venari Group UK. On the podcast, we only align ourselves with absolute premium quality and that of course includes people such as Venari Group really breaking boundaries stepping forward passion obsession for customer satisfaction and they drive that British manufacturer to its fullest a big thanks to Ollie and the team and we look forward to seeing some of the incredible work that Venari have got coming out in 2021 next up but by no means least is PBI performance products PBR products are protection without compromise. Renowned for their unique combination of flame resistance, durability, and comfort. I have worn PBR products since starting my career 13 years now, and they are the very first choice in protection for pretty much every extreme condition from NASA astronauts to emergency responders, the military, Formula One. They have cracked the nugget when it comes to increasing thermal and break open resistance, but not only sustaining, but offering a greater flame protection as our first line of defense when we're in there in the heat of the moment. So it goes without saying we are a massive fan of PBI and it's great to have them as a fan and a sponsor of the podcast. A big thanks once again to our long-term sponsor, William Wood Watches. William Wood Watches is a UK-based watch manufacturer where upcycling is taken to a whole new level. William Wood are all about history on your wrist and feeling the beat of the fire service with you every step of the way. William Wood Watches has the vision to be the leading sustainable watch brand that upcycles rescue service materials for a new life, once forgotten, now reborn. So get over, have a look, get yourself registered and check out some of the incredible stuff at williamwoodwatches.com. So there you have it. That's the names in the frames. That's the people supporting this wonderful episode today. So let's jump in there with Matt. Like I said, folks, today is a really good episode to be rocking up to the Firefighters podcast. If you've missed us for a little while, you pick a hell of an episode to get back in. If you're into the fire service, if you're into your fitness, if you've gone through a setback and you need that little bit of mental resolve and something to jumpstart and crank that effort up, Matt's a great example of consistency and how that hard work pays off. So thanks for coming back to the Firefighters podcast. Let's jump in there. And I will see you on the other side. There he is. Hello. How are you doing, handsome? <laughs> yeah, not too bad, mate. You? Awesome, brother. Kicking ass and taking names. Yeah. Matt Fulcher, welcome to the Firefighters Podcast. How are you doing, brother? Yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you very much, mate. So you and I got in contact with each other basically because we see each other doing all sort of crazy uh, fitness online. Uh, I was surprised to see that you're based in the UK as well. So you're a London firefighter, been in nine years, and you're one hell of a fitness beast, ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's not self-proclaimed. Uh, thing, no, no, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stamp <laughs> uh, that one. I am definitely a firefighter, yeah. So yeah, yeah. based in London, it's stationed at Tottenham. Yeah. And yeah, I, I love it. It's, it's quality, I love it. Tottenham's a, a really interesting place to work. I know we, we can get onto all the fitness stuff, but that's a really challenging like demographic. There's such a such an interesting group of people in, in London in general because I think it's such like a melting pot of different cultures that come to London. Being a firefighter there must be very different to being a firefighter in any other city, I imagine. Yeah, I, I think that, I think that's right. I think especially as I live in the I live in Bedfordshire okay. and then work in London. I think the difference, like the contrast between the two, is massive. And like you said, the demographic is so so varied that yeah. you, you don't know what you're going to be turning up to, really. Uh, so it makes for a very interesting uh, shouts, stories, and experiences. Right? <laughs> very well politically answered. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, I think, is it quite a common thing that a lot of firefighters from London tend not to live in the area? Not because anything bad with London, but obviously it's really expensive to live there. And there is, there is some people have some serious commutes. I mean, yours is a good hour's drive or, or 45 minutes or so to get into London, isn't it? Is that quite a common thing that London firefighters don't necessarily live in London? Yeah, I think it seems to be that way. I'd say at our station, I think a high percentage of people probably live 
outside of outside of London. The majority of people probably live in Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire. Okay. <clears throat> We're surrounding like counties really with London. I don't know if that's because of obviously house prices and then obviously and then the addition of like London weight and obviously that you get within London that people like to try and they're happy to travel in because we said before we came on about changing gears as well because it's a nice way to to kind of detach isn't it because the intense fast-paced life of any uh, capital city for anyone you're sort of living all over the world i suppose the ability to change gears you say you like stepping away and you know you got you got a child and spending time with the missus and going out in the countryside and getting that detachment is that a big part do you think of what keeps you sane with all due respect yeah i i think it has partly to do with that i think having the two options there makes me appreciate both more yeah. for what they are. Like I don't necessarily need one or the other, but having, the, having both of them, they complement each other. Yeah. So <clears throat> coming away from like a busy tour at, at Tottenham and then I've had to deal with loads of traffic going in and out of work or we've, we've been busy. I've been uh, cramming in gym sessions before, during and after work yeah. and things like that. You come back, when I come uh, to my days off, I, te- I tend to need them now. So I need my rest days coming away the peacefulness in the countryside, no traffic, spending time with the family, dog walks, things, these things like that. They're really, really relaxed. It helps you unwind. My recovery is better. Yeah. And then when I come back, to having to go back to work, I'm then desperate to be back. Yeah, it gives yeah. me that sort I'm of. I'm the life. same. I'm the same. Yeah. We, have, we have our days yeah. off, and I feel like I've been off for a bloody week. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah. when I'm back, it feels like I've been gone for ages, and I'm and I'm ready for it again. Then I think that's where yeah. a lot of fire services across the whole world, you know, have different <laughs> shift systems which allow for. I know, I know there's a difficulty with the aspect of nights and some people still struggle working nights and stuff like that, but I think it's a better kind of work life. I hate the word balance because I'm, you know, a recovered addict that I'm not really one that's very good at balance yeah. in, any, in any shape. Uh, or I know, there's, not, there's not really such thing as balance, is there? No, no, it's, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's BS really. Bal- it, well, there is a balance, but it's relative to each person is how I feel. You know, your balance and my yeah, balance. Yeah, my balance is very different to my wife's balance. You know, she thinks yeah. I'm all going no quit. When we first met for probably the first three years, she she thought I was constantly going to burn out. She was like, this is not sustainable. This dude's just going to blow up and I'm going to catch the pieces. And yeah. we're, we're whatever we are, 10 years in. And uh, if anything, things are accelerating as I unload the unhelpful habits and the, the bad habits of the past. And you know, we talk about efficiencies and streamlines and stuff like that. But um, I wanted to ask, what is the shift-based system down in London? Just for anybody that's unfamiliar with it. Obviously, I think the same as when I was so we do two day shifts, two night shifts. Uh, the day shifts uh, being at 9.30 till... Eight o'clock at night, and obviously the nights to opposite. So eight o'clock that See evening that, till nine. I love day. that. And I think that's really unique, and I, I like that because a lot of places we do twelve hours, two days, two nights, four off. But it's that seven seven, which I think is is a little bit archaic. I much prefer what you guys do because I imagine for anybody who's unfamiliar, designed to miss a lot of the push and a lot of the shift changes and perhaps the incident peaks. Is is that anything to do with that? Literally, I think it was like a year or two before I joined. They just changed the shift to those to those hours, and okay. before they were nine to six, six to nine, and things like that. I think it was obviously part of a more of a money saving thing in terms of testing the machines and oh, this, that, and the other. And oh. but the only thing it does give you is obviously you got a lot longer during the day, which is which is good when you're coming in on nights. So you've got more that you can get done within that time. But then you miss the evenings on your on your day shifts. So you do technically miss four evenings in a row, but then you obviously with the four off in a row, mm. you've got quite a long time to actually plan other stuff and use it to your advantage, really. So is that all across your brigade? I don't get too deep into it. Do they not do any 24-hour shifts on any of the stations? Is there no... No, all stations in London will do that same shift pattern Wow. with, uh, yeah, with the four watches working those, those hours. Okay, because I know a lot of stations have switched to, to not switch, but they have their facility for 24-hour shifts, which, again has the pros and cons people that live a long way away can go in work for three 24-hour shifts straight and then travel back and we, we've got people who live in like dublin or something ridiculous like that and they will literally yeah they'll take a four or five hour journey in work three days straight and then go back and have like six days off and you're like okay maybe you could justify it and if somebody were heading into london for, for london wages in that respect i'm sure some people w- would still do it so you've been in nine years now why did you first want to join the service uh, well i think if you're going to take it as far back as as possible you know every I'm sure every kid dressed up as a firefighter growing up, right? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> so, I still do it now. Yeah, I never grow up in man. It doesn't get it doesn't get old now. Uh, so I think it started down as deep as that, I think, really. If you're gonna go into like the complexities of it, even just being a massive superhero geek from a young age. Oh man. <clears> oh, I think, do you think there's an aspect of that in the muscle building as well? Because I was I was the same. I was oh, yeah. Hulk, I was all of that. I just you idealised this heroic yeah. aspect, didn't you? I think you grow up watching X Men cartoons, Spider Man cartoons. I think 
you sort of associate that that's how maybe how maybe men should look or should behave and stuff like that. So maybe if I was to see a psychiatrist, they'd probably come out with some sort of superhero complex there. Oh, uh, but yeah, one hundred percent. It's all worked out for the good. Though. So you first brother. joined that. Did you ever sort of fall not out of love with it? But was there a moment in time because I know you you pursued university first, didn't you? Was there a time when you sort of drifted away from it? Because I sort of went away from it and came came back to it. Was there a time when either through your own desires or the expectations of people around you were you ever drawn in a different direction before coming back to the fire service yeah completely mate. i think that was when i was at, when i was at school and in the last couple of years when you're going through uni applications and stuff like that the school really drove hard that people really should be going to uni that's how it felt and although my thoughts were elsewhere that i could probably be doing joining the fire service or the police or even yeah. even the army across my mind and stuff like that just something in that God, sort of things things got nearly got really bad then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I feeling for you. No, no, don't don't well. go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. You're better so, than that. Two of, my, two of my best mates are coppers as well, so they'll love it. <laughs> love <that. laughs> we had guy um, from um, Blue Light Card. He was a firefighter. Uh, sorry, he was a police officer when they first started Blue Light Card, and they've got uh, well over a million users now. And I said exactly the same to him. He said, "I oh, joined the police service," and I was like, "Oh, was that when you yeah. failed to get into the fire service?" And he was like, "Nah, come on." I was like, they, they hate that bless them, but some of them is true anyway. Yeah. yeah, so I think when you're at school, when sixteen and six form. Our school were really pushing hard. You'd have like specific like periods during the day where it was just designed for you to write your application to to universities, and it was like that's what you should be pursuing. You're you've got this potential that you could do that, so we think you should. So that sort of changed my mindset of having to maybe okay, maybe I should be doing this. Maybe I should go further my education and then decide what I want to do. Ed- education is a funny one, isn't it? What do you think was, when I say further my education, because education is lateral. Do you know what I mean? It's not just vertical as in like, I've got a diploma, then I've got a degree, then I've got a doctorate, then I've got a master's. There's lots of ways, as you'll know now, because your development has gone wide and deep as well in terms of the physiology, yeah. physiology and your knowledge and stuff about fitness. But what is, what do you think it was about that? Because I had the same thing. You know, I sat down with a guy from Connections or whatever it was, and they would sit you down and say, yeah, that's exactly right. it. This is how you should do it. You need to apply for at least three. And, you know, we were encouraged to onboard this massive amount of debt without any real knowledge. And I'm not vilifying people that have gone over to university. It's it served some people really well. But why Why did you step away from that fire? Was it, was it driven by money? Was it driven by, oh, if you don't do this, Matt, you're not going to get your potential? What do you think? I know it's a while ago now, but we're well, not, not yeah. that long ago. You're not that old. But. It, was, it was more that second one there, really. More about the pressure just being sort of persuaded into it and pressured into it saying you know you should go to uni you can you can have offers from these top unis for I'd apply to this for an exercise science so it's like right you've been accepted here there you shouldn't miss that opportunity to to do that's that it, isn't it and we think there's an opportunity we're never going to get back but you do get you know people yeah. that go back to university in their 20s 30s 40s but there's something about being young like no you should do it now I think it's easy, you're easily influenced aren't you when you're that age I think so yeah, you listen to like your mentors at school and, and things like that and they're saying right this is a good opportunity for you it's a prestigious university. You should probably go there and and have the the benefit of learning from them. And but it's one of those thought, things that people will teach you what they know, which sounds stupid and obvious. But if you're if you're in an education facility, someone that pitches you is going to pitch you education. You don't get very many entrepreneurs yeah. going into school and giving talks because ironically they would probably encourage people to laterally develop themselves their education their knowledge you know I often tell people that or the, the famous quote goes what is it don't allow your education to limit your knowledge base or something like that as in don't don't allow what you learn at school to limit how much you develop yourself personally because it's you know trying to fit yourself in that box and being judged by metrics from a curriculum is the old, you know, trying to judge a fish by yeah. its ability to climb a tree. It can be quite challenging. And you're somebody that yeah, yeah. D- does have that entrepreneurial edge. Because I know we're going to get onto, you know, starting your business and stuff like that. But you did sort of take that hook to start with and you, you went to uni, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was at uni for a year. Uh, I went to a local university in the end. I sort of met in the middle of the pressures. Instead of going away, so for example, I had, I had offers from Loughborough and Bath to go do your sport exercise science there. They were the ones that people were pushing me to do. Love uh, is amazing. Oh, exactly. university, especially for the courses I was doing and what I wanted to specialise in. Anyway, and then in the end, I thought, you know, I don't really want to do that. This is, I'll stay local. I'll stay local, and sort of was half-assing it really. Were you already into your? Um, 
Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. Did that play yeah. a factor in any way, shape, or form? Because I was, I was. I'll be honest. I went to Loughborough specifically because they had the best gyms and they had some amazing power, <laughs> powerlifting teams and stuff like that. And I barely attended any yeah. classes. I went and just trained with the powerlifters and the Olympic teams and stuff like that. And and that yeah. that steered me. And it's so that's such small thinking looking back, but. Were you already into your training then? I was, but nowhere near as deep as I am now, really. I don't think that would have been a massive influence. I think it was more just not not being into it, not really liking the change of what happened. That I didn't sort of then then commit to it, and I was I was never invested in that. So I never gave hundred percent because I didn't believe uh, what in what I was doing. It's kind of that. So it wasn't until you're like university doesn't work for me well it doesn't work for you because you don't believe in it but if you don't believe in it it's not going to work and it's a self-perpetuating cycle and some people go to university and get two or three degrees and then a master it and they do really well but for some people they're just it's that round peg square hole and you were you were built for a different different beast i suppose yeah exactly that really but i'm still sorry so i don't i don't regret that because that made me push more for obviously what i do now so i think it was a good sometimes you've got to do what you don't know You've got so you've got to do what you don't like in order to know what you do want to do. Do you know what I mean? And some people yeah. think it's a mistake, but it's not. It's a way to find out what you don't like, and you go, "That's good. I know yeah, I don't exactly. like it now." There's no "what if" factor because yeah. I went and did it and I didn't enjoy it. Yeah, it also taught me to not be be influenced by others as well. Just follow my, you know what I mean? Just follow my own path, be my own man. If I know I can do something, then I'm going to do it. Mm. So, how was that about. conversation with the with the stakeholders in your life? If you know what I mean, sort of spouses or parents or friends or yeah, I suppose it's a little bit awkward, really. I think. A little bit, there's a little bit of disappointment there, maybe that I wasn't sort of committed to something that had, that had obviously would, would have cost money and put me in debt and would technically then put me behind like a year or two in where I'd want to be anyway. Yeah, but, but I think, what, we we messed stuff up for years. I say to people, you know, I'm I'm in my early 30s now and I feel like I'm just getting traction with some awesome stuff. I think you can mess up the first 25 years and really completely mess it up. You know, from addiction yeah. to drugs to finances, and you have still got a good 50 years to knock it out of the park. Um, it's kind of like you, ha- you have to get those battle scars first. Yeah, def- yeah, definitely. And I think, like I said, in the long run, coming out of uni, and then I had a couple of schools that I worked at in the meantime while I was trying to apply for the fire service. And working at those schools was, was massive for me because that's where I sort of started to learn all my life skills and sort of see the, see the real world a bit more, which I hadn't seen to that point because all you all I've done is obviously been like spoon fed at school and yeah. stuff like that. It was pretty easy and now I've gone to uni, that didn't work, so now I've got to try and work, get out there for myself. So I worked at a couple of education support centres. What drew um, you to an education was, support centre? That's a, it's, a, it's an interesting way to go, but they must be quite difficult positions to do that some of the students yeah. can be quite challenging, I imagine. Yeah, they are. And, and, and to be honest, a teacher, sort of being a sort of PE teacher, had always been sort of in sort of my mind potentially when I was at uni that that could be an option. Yeah. So when I came out, I also knew people that had I had contact at that both of these schools. Uh, basically, which we 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 get into there. I thought I needed a job really that was going to look impressive. You'd already pivoted into the what what tools can I get in my tool belt to bolster my application? If you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Obviously, I'm working with ended up working with students that have been removed from mainstream schools mm-hmm. um, and in like alternative like education and stuff. So yeah, it's a real life lesson there. Working with lots of children. What sort of skills you know, do you think you picked up in there? Because I think you know that's a really accelerated way to build uh, rapport, understanding your your ability to communicate. What were some of the tools that yeah. you best picked up there that you now think? Because so, they they say this to people, you know, when people in public service stuff at college and stuff, they're like, "Oh, go and do some volunteer work." This, this, and I agree, but I think they don't tangibly demonstrate or explain what the benefit is. So, you, I mean, you obviously then became a successful firefighter. So what were some of the things that you think you took from that sort of grassroots development? Uh, there's a few, really. Communication you mentioned from there straight away. I think that was massive for me. And all, from both levels, really. I think it also enabled me now to be able to explain things in the simplest term. Okay. Even though you might know the full educated answer with all the long words or whatever it means. <laughs> yeah. if, you can't, if you can't explain something to somebody who doesn't know it in the simplest term, then do you really know, even know it yourself? If, Absolutely, you know I mean? mate. Absolutely it. agree with that. I think Einstein said that, didn't he? He was like, if you should be able to explain it to a child. I always think people like, um, what was his name? He was on radio for ages, years and years ago. Brian Cox, sorry. Brian know. Cox. Yeah, yeah. Brian. He is fantastic because when he explains meteorology or something like that, or even just, just basic physics or something like that, and you're like, wow, I get it. I get it. And, and it yeah. should be. We're so drawn to complexity, and I, and I wanted to ask you this later on, but I, I'll kind of slip it in now a little bit as well, because you see this in fitness, don't you? 
people love complexity. You see some trainers that don't necessarily feel confident in their abilities, so they lean on complexity. I think that's one of the key points I've learned, and I've managed to obviously then transfer that into into the fitness industry, hopefully, that when I do explain things to people, whether that's an Instagram post or one-to-one with a client, that they know, they understand what I'm saying. They're not just thinking, oh, it's some gibberish now. Yeah, it's gibber- yeah, yeah, and they're nodding, but they're like, I don't quite get it. But I love that, because I think yeah. on, on the face of it, a lot of your content and stuff is beautifully simplistic. Do you know what I mean? It's not too long, it's not yeah. too complex, complex and there's a tangible nugget to be taken away from each thing do you know what i mean you haven't you don't feel like you don't look like you're burdened with oh i've got to explain it 17 different ways to hopefully they get it people are bored by then a lot of yours is simple yeah. to the point and easy to understand it's something somebody can pick up and use oh, yeah that's all my main, my main aim really with instagram is to have um, like each post has a certain like value hopefully to someone and mm-hmm. it it's easy to interpret. So anyone can jump on and read it. Obviously on Instagram, you're accessible to the world pretty much. So yeah. a beginner, an advanced level or an intermediate level trainer can jump on and maybe think, okay, I, I like what he's saying there. So, so yeah, that's, I'd say communication is definitely a big one. I imagine in the fire service one. as well, that was a massive helper as well, because, you know, you went to situations as, as, as we all do in the emergency services where there's a lot of high octane energy and adrenaline going on. So breaking something down and getting a very clear and concise answer from somebody yeah, the second one I was going to say was probably responsibility. Really, I think having and also being a, a sort of like a role model. Right? The mm-hmm. two schools that I worked at, there was very few young male staff that worked in there. Okay, in the schools, so I had actually had the closest age gap to the students in the school, so they felt like they could relate to me a bit more than some of the older members of staff. And mm-hmm. um, obviously, we still had similar in- interests. So we were still playing football, still playing Xbox, still yeah. doing all the same. Pretty much just doing all the same things. I was just maybe what was I? Probably maybe seven. Eight years old, and that's it. That was that was quite. Um, you were a lot more relatable way. to them, yeah. But it did it did hold, exactly, you, yeah. almost give you more responsibility because it was easier for you to connect, and they're more likely to copy your habits and behaviours and mannerisms more so than they would have yeah. from a forty, fifty year old. Like you were saying, predominantly females in the places that you worked. Yeah, I think that was probably the earliest point that you realise you've got to be like a male role model to some uh, to some people, whether you choose to be or not. You are in that position now where you. People are going to look up to you and either copy what you do or, or, or not, depending on what example you're saying, I think. So. How do you feel people relate to that in the fire service? Because I have this, I have not an argument, but I have this debate sometimes with other members of the emergency services when I say, look, you know, guys, we've got a bit of a responsibility. You know, we're in a role that has been around long before we were here and long after, but we're going to put our stamp on it. We're going to drop our own little bit of us into the cocktail of what people's interpretation of, of the emergency services is. When Matt goes out there and you're on the front line, you're jumping off the pump and running into a you know a high-rise building you might be that first person's ever interaction with a firefighter and for all intents and purpose you represent fire service all over the world and you have a, a responsibility and some people feel like ah, oh, you know what no i don't it's not just that I, i'm just myself i'm not the whole fire service and they don't want to hold themselves to that that same level how do you feel about that and how can you talk around that yeah that's a difficult one isn't it because everyone's got everyone's got different standards but i think particularly with how close-knit uh, the watches that I work with, the standard is pretty much is uniform throughout. And that's sort of led by the governor, the officers and senior hands down, basically, since yeah. I started. When you're young and you're coming in and you're, you're fresh out of training school, those are the guys that, that mould you into the firefighter you are now, really. And mm. I think as long as you stick to the standards that they taught you when you were younger, when they were, when they were trying to mould you into what they wanted you to be, I think if you, as long, the longer you keep those standards up, the better and better you're yeah. going to be as a firefighter. That's the thing, isn't and it? Yeah. What was your yeah. basic training like? What's training like for people that, that, that join London? Training was, I think whether it was 16 or 18, sort of like weeks. Yeah. Um, uh, at the time, it was at Southwark Training Centre. Okay. Uh, it was in, cent- like in central London. And that was Monday to Friday. And you obviously go for all your different... Uh, like modules of training pumps, some others, BA. Was that residential? RPC. No, it wasn't. So you go home so every just, night? Yeah, yeah, I just commute, commute in uh, every day on the train and then fall asleep on the train and went back home. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely smoked. Was London the first yeah. one that you applied for? Because I know for most people, and to, to see you now, you've been in nine years, you, you've been, you know, we're going to talk about some of the great stuff that you've done as, as part of the fire service, but it's hard for people to connect with uh, people that have been in a long time because like oh it's so easy for you but was it the first one you ever went for or did you did you have to try a few times or were you straight in? I wasn't straight in so um, the first service I applied for was Hertfordshire and then I got through to the interview stage and then didn't make, didn't make it through and that was when I was I think I must have been maybe 21 at that point I think so this was still sort of relatively fresh to coming out of uni I went for that straight away didn't get in I thought it was a big felt like a big setback at the time mm. 
And then it was in a period where no one was recruiting. For London had recruited for, I think, maybe two years or something at that point. So yeah, I had this sort of goal that I wanted to achieve. But everywhere I kept on looking, no one was open. No, recruitment wasn't open. I couldn't apply. I couldn't get in. That's the thing, isn't it? When when you talk about a goal set, I know you do a lot of goal setting with clients and stuff now. When I talk to people about controlling the controllables, they set sometimes things that are outside of their control. You know, it's like, yeah. what's one of your goals for the year? Having the restrictions lifted from the government. Right, you've got no control over that. Do you know what I mean? Even with the, the social media or with the podcast summit, my goal is 10,000 downloads. Right, well, you can't, you can influence it, but you can't control that. How yeah. did you deal with some of those setbacks? Because I know, again, setbacks is something that you probably spend a lot of time talking with people who have a goal and then struggle with it. You've obviously had your setbacks yourself. Was that one of your first ones? Ones. You obviously had the realization at uni and then missing out on the fire brigade and it looks like nobody was recruiting. How do you sustain that mindset when you're taking setbacks like that? Although I couldn't apply to any of the fire services locally, I could still do things to make me a better applicant when it came around. So that was my main focus really. And that was the large part of working at the schools, like I said. Yeah. I could go there and I knew that I could build experiences and a, a good application that people would want in the fire service basically. Yeah. So that was sort of my, my focus then changed to that. Training was alongside that as well. Mm. So when it comes to joining the fire service, I knew that I was going to be as fit as strong as I could be, have as much sort of real real world experience behind me as well, compared so, to when I was 21. So when it came to be a next applying, I was a better version of that. Preparing that situation before it comes rather than the situation coming and you're not prepared. So many people wait for it to crop up and then go, oh God, I need to start practicing the bleep test or I need to get myself in shape. Yeah. And you're like, hold yourself to a higher standard than is realistically possible the, the, to other people. It needs to be almost unrealistic for other people and you should have that as your base level. So that if you need to change gears, you can do when, when the application's open and stuff like that. So was it the second time or, or third time that you finally got in? Yeah, so the second time, London had opened by this point and, and I, luckily I got in the first time around with, uh, with London. And, um, well, you say luckily, mate. I'm, you know, I'm going to challenge you there because yeah, you've already referenced yeah. you had put a lot of time in, you'd done all these extra curric- We're recognising ourselves, you know, there's this, self, this UK self-defamation and I have to challenge almost every flipping guest about it. You were, yes, there was an aspect of luck. But you also leveraged luck. You placed yourself in a lucky position, quote unquote. You know, because you'd done the preparation. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I, I, to you, I totally agree with that. I've said things about like luck doesn't really exist. I think I was lucky they opened at that time. Fortunately, I opened at that time. I wasn't lucky necessarily that I got in because I knew I put myself in the strongest position to uh, succeed to that point. Because so. otherwise, lucky is quite offensive, isn't it? You know, people would say lucky to you, and you're like, you, you didn't. You could have yeah. gone and done worked in schools. You could have kept yourself in shape. You could have kept sending requests on the email. You could have kept ringing the HR department but you didn't and that's okay yeah. don't hang the hook of luck on me claim yeah. you know and be that volunteer victim because oh it was just Matt because he was in the right place at the right time yeah and he prepared preparedness yeah. is like 80% being in the right place is 10% at the right time is another 10% but if you ain't ready opportunities pass you by every day they're a dime a dozen but you just ain't ready for them yeah you know I completely agree with that uh, about luck I think with luck a lot of the stuff come up particularly during uh, the lockdown so the lock- over the past year where yeah. I've heard sort of like, like flipping comments of people saying oh you're lucky or even some messages on Instagram we saying, oh you're so lucky that you can still train in a gym this that and the other I actually did a post about it on Instagram at the time and I was like the reasons why I can still train in a gym is, is not luck one it's because like I said I worked hard to get in the job in the first place mm-hmm. two it's because we take I take my fitness seriously and three it's because across the station we've got a lot of guys that are into their training so we've invested a lot of money in our gym <laughs> that's so the biggest one mate it's the money aspect because I've had exactly yeah. the same thing people say oh yeah it's alright for you with your own gym and I'm like I've spent 30 grand on that kit yeah. do you know what I mean exactly. do, do, you want, do you want to put yourself in 30 grand a day do you want to work hard enough to get yeah. there you can do it you know, this is not some esoteric thing. Barbells are not, you know, diamonds from the from the bottom of the ocean. You can buy them any way you like. They cost money. Earn money, yeah. buy them. It is difficult. You must do rainy days and long nights and work jobs you don't like to get the things that you want. And that's just the way it works. And you, you yeah. guys have done that hard work. Yeah, I completely agree, man. And that's exactly why, yeah, I shouldn't really use that word because my thoughts are the same, really. We're going to drop it, don't worry. I'm not... <laughs> I'm going to start. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, just... So um, in the job, working day to day, you've said about being around, being around guys that hold themselves. You spoke about standards. How much does the, I'm going to call it value of association because that's kind of what it is. What's it like being around people that operate at that level? And and is this, it, does everybody operate at that level where you are? Because I think that's a bit of an illusion. You know, even in, in my brigade, in my station, actually it's quite rare that some people want to keep themselves fit and healthy and are looking to develop themselves all the time. That That's a little bit of a 
um, mirage that we try and sustain. You're a great example of it, but I don't think you're necessarily as common as people think you are. Yeah, it's a pretty mixed bag, to be honest, when it comes to training, I think. I know when I was at training school for the fire service, I was thinking, I thought I was going to turn up and I thought everyone was going to be, I thought everyone was going to look amazing. I thought, it was probably just gave into the stereotypes, thinking everyone's going to look like, yeah, <laughs> you know everyone's, what I mean? yeah. Years and, and stuff like that. And yeah, someone would be yeah, blasting that. a hose across the yard and somebody would be there in their, in their tunic with their leggings out, just, you know, ripping a barbell off the floor or swinging a mace. Yeah. So, let's get the axes and the hoses out and we'll use them as battle ropes and like, nobody wanted, yeah. nobody wanted to play. <laughs> but, uh, no, so I, I think, like I said, uh, just now with our station and obviously everyone wants to uh, put money into it and it's been like invested in making it uh, one of the best gyms certainly uh, across London I think it's the that's, fact a that claim. A lot of guys- that's a claim right there Matt that's a claim <laughs> across the, across yeah. the country yeah. okay. I'm going to get them to send photos <laughs> in of people's gyms we've got a bloody good one uh, in one of uh, yeah. our you know what? Yeah, I, I love it there man so I'll, 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 I'll big it up because I love the gym we've got there working, 100% and, um, and so you should so yeah. you should yeah I think because of that there's a lot of guys across watches that, that train together. You've got training partners across different watches. You've got uh, watches that train together. They do circuit training out in the yard as a, as a group. You've got guys that all do more gym-based training, functional training out in the yard. It's, it's a real mixed bag, to be honest. And um, it is a bit of a philosophy of the station that training is important, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I think across the across the brigade, maybe that's not the case, but I think... Well, I know you've spoken before, think, and it's some of the content that you share around, how important it is to have the balance of physical and mental health, because you sort of referenced it there, and I know it's something you've had your experiences with, and I know it's something you sort of champion, both with clients and, and in the fire service. So talk around that, if you will, and how much you think it's either played a role for you personally, or, or the effect that you think it has on other operations personnel or your clients physical mental health training is, is a large part of that i think for the majority of people i think you've got a, a point where for myself like i'm a very competitive guy and um i, I come across obviously pretty laid back and, and and relaxed but when it comes to to sport or the gym or anything like that then i'm very very competitive and i want to i want to win basically even if this is something that's something really small like it's just me against myself or a team event or whatever i've always wanted to, to do better yeah, and I think that's a massive part of like pushing yourself to see what you're capable of. Yeah, and I think that's a and that's a big part of mental health because I think a lot of people that don't have the confidence or don't believe in themselves mm. are, are too scared to to try and they're too scared to to fail at stuff. Whereas when you train day in day out, I pretty much fail at something in the gym every day. Oh god, yeah, absolutely. So you become used to you like failure then becomes commonplace. So yeah, it's part of failure. the process. It's an expected part of the process. You need to slowly edge towards the edge and find out where the edge is. And you know, knowing what yeah. is knowing what is the edge of safe limitation and what is injury is a, is a line I've personally struggled with at times and, and pushing it too far because it's it's important to like you say break through those barriers both mentally and physically. But have you ever accidentally broken through a barrier that was actually a genuine stop Matt you're going to hurt yourself mentally or physically is there ever a barrier that you've had to blow through or that you have blown through that was actually the edge of safety not from a safety point of view no I'm, I'm lucky that I've never had any injuries in, inside the gym oh, uh, training Good. wise I've always well yeah I've always been I've always done well to stay injury free in the gym uh, which is good. I'm quite, quite sort of meticulous with my training and exercise selection and stuff. That I choose things that I know aren't going to necessarily injure me or I know to push it at the right times when either I've got a spot or the safety bars are set up or I'm in a machine rather than on a freeway, for example. Now I can take a bit more like these with extra reps and, and stuff like that. So I think that's a large point of that. But I also think every time, I think this goes for a lot of people as well, is when they hit like a plateau, for example, they think that might be there or they think that's this, but they just haven't gone for, they haven't gone past it yet. So I think that's important about sort of evolving your training and your sort of physique and mindset all as one. So every time you hit a plateau, is that that's, that's not your ceiling. Like that's, you've got to bust through that. I think that's a massive point of like where it's not just we're not just building bodies, we're building characters along the way. You know, it's yeah. like that's a massive part of it. I love that building bodies and, and building characters. Like, <laughs> so you you hit that what appears to be a ceiling, but you just need to shift left or shift right. Because the opening is just not directly above you. If we think about it in a in an ascending fashion of training, I'm getting fitter and or stronger and or more flexible and or you know more explosive. It may yeah. very simply be you need to change lanes. You need to shift over into change your intensity, change your weight, change your rest, change your nutrition, perhaps. And those will be the 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 subtle shifts. And they develop character as well because they like like you just said there encourage you to go into flat spots, voids in your training. And sometimes when people look like they're doing 
something that's difficult. It's no longer difficult because I've been doing it for so long. You know, I used to train ridiculously and I would eat every two hours. And I mean, every two hours, you know, I'd be waking up at three, at five, at seven, nine, eleven. And people would think, oh God, that's A, it's really unhealthy, but B, wow, it's really committed. But I passed a certain point. It's not because it just becomes life. The real challenges are challenging yourself from an educational standpoint or challenging yourself in a different area of your own development or, or fitness even because that's where the flat spot is. Where did your sort of passion for sport or physical development start? Well, I'd say pretty young. I started just doing bodyweight exercises when I was when I was really young. Really, I think that's probably down to my just watching my dad. To be honest, I think he was a, he was a runner. He didn't train in the gym or anything, but he used to go running most days. Mm. Then he'd come back and in the garden he'd do like pull ups, push ups, sit ups. Nice every day. So then I started joining in. This was probably the age between like eight and ten. Like I started joining in doing stuff like that. I used, and then I took it upon myself to try and do like fifty before bed every of each every single night. And then it, it just went. And then you sort of, I guess it just sort of escalated from that. You're obviously old enough then. That you're your football training and your football coaches are getting you to do proper training rather than just running around having fun. Yeah. Uh, you, and then it, it just sort of escalated from there. And I've, I've always loved the training, really, whether it was for a sport um, or, or in the gym. I've just loved that sort of physical uh, aspect of having to sort of like push yourself. Or when was the first time you started to... getting into gym work? Because, you know, press-ups and pull-ups and hill sprints and stuff like that are lots of fun until you first see whatever, it, you first see pumping iron or you first see something like that and you're like, barbells and stuff. Oh, God, barbells and dumbbells and steel. So I think the first time I actually would actually go to a gym, when I was in six form really uh, so we were allowed in six form we were allowed to choose a, a sport or an activity that we could go and do as part of our sort of PE block yeah. of the day sort of thing and uh, for one of them I, I did choose a gym nice and, and I'd go and I'd go down there and I, I wouldn't really have a clue what I was doing I just enjoyed being in this gym yeah. so I started to just jump one machine to another I wasn't training for bodybuilding or weights I, I just literally would just jump from one machine to another I just enjoyed being there obviously yeah. rather than being at school that was all, so that was quite nice. But it wasn't until I got into, I'd say probably when I got into sort of playing men's football that I sort of thought I was quite a sort of skinny kid, really. That I had to sort of try and put on some size um, and strength, really, to, to compete a bit better, really. Yeah, to protect yourself because it's uh, it's a very physical game on a on the park on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. It can get pretty messy. You know, there's a lot of skin gets exchanged. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. I think you go from playing uh, obviously boys football at the age of like 16, 17, or whatever, and you cross over to the men's league. And um, yeah. you're still that skinny kid. You just you just get booted up and down. Like whether you, <laughs> yeah, you'd be able to you've got some guy in the mid thirties to... just come and kick the hell out of you early on in the game, and then just wants to put you in your place. And you're like, oh, just get pushed yeah. off the ball constantly. That's when I started getting into a bit more. That's when I was, yeah, I was 17, started training um, in the gym a bit more for the purpose of putting on size and strength. Mm. But obviously, I wouldn't class it as bodybuilding then. But no, no. But just trying to change my appearance and, and my performance. Which so from from seventeen then to how old are you now? Thirty. Thirty three. So you've stayed pretty damn consistent and motivated for all that time, and not managed to pick up any massive injuries. And I know you've you've even delved into some some competitive bodybuilding aspects just to try and sculpt different aspects of your physique. How have you managed to sustain that level of motivation for the best part of sixteen years now? I said obviously I haven't uh, sustained any injuries in the gym. The reason why I think I've been so consistent with my bodybuilding is because when I was in my young twenties, I did rupture my ACL when playing football so and that was obviously killer and then after that pretty much since then I haven't really played contact sport you know what I'm and the same mate did- I'm the same I did uh, sort of roller hockey and ice hockey I played roller hockey up to Team GB and it was really I miss it I really miss it I miss the team sport and I miss the violence of it to be honest with you but yeah. I did it did frustrate me how how myself included because I used to do it to other people would oh. maliciously be coming out to bloody hurt you they're coming out to hurt you damage your knee damage your shoulder and it's just so annoying do you know what I wasn't scared of it, but I was like, this is something that's going to really bother me for another six weeks because I'm going to hurt my shoulder. I'm going to hurt my knee. And I'm like, it's just not worth it sometimes. I think that was a turning point really for me because then obviously football had to stop. And that was around uh, the time, obviously, that I was in the job as well. Yeah. So I couldn't really take well, the risk of people getting injured playing football. So pretty much then, all my efforts then went from playing sport and doing a little bit of the gym on the side to everything now is the gym. Yeah. and all my competitive side then was just driven into that mm. and that's that's when things changed really that I started to, to train properly I was I was then started to, to read up on things a lot more and then my competitive edge then come from me just trying to get better in the gym rather than having to display in like a 
it's for. How much do you think the competitive edge is a good thing and how much it serves you? Because I am super competitive. I love it. But I suppose as I've gotten a little bit older, I've been able to flex that competitive muscle when and when it's not appropriate, you know. But I feel like we've lost a competitive edge in lots of things. It's important that people people understand that hard work pays off, you know, and uh, try, trying hard is good. And, uh, and competitive edge drives a lot of camaraderie and a lot of teamwork and, you know, dealing with setbacks. If nobody keeps scoring, nobody lose. How are you going to deal with a setback? How much do you think yeah. the competitive edge is a healthy thing or not? I think, it is a, I think it is a healthy thing. I think as much as it can be the opposite, I think as you get older, you learn to control it. I, I haven't lost my competitive edge. It's no different to when I was younger and I used to sulk or be a sore loser for, <laughs> for days we lost at the weekend or, yeah. or something like that. Whereas now I, I can channel it a lot better and I can put it back into the session. Whereas, like I said, when you're younger, you, you don't know how to use that energy. Yeah, focus, well, it's emotional focus. intelligence, isn't it? And, and we do still see, yeah. we still see people with thirties, forties, fifties, sixties who never quite master emotional intelligence. And I wonder if sometimes it's because they have avoided the competitive edge. Therefore, when it does still rear its head, because even if you say, "Oh, I'm not competitive," yeah, but when you lose your job you're still going to be really angry because something's been taken away from you or when a friend gets promoted and you don't, even if you're not the sort of person that engages in a, in a sporting capacity, competitive aspects are in so many aspects of life. And it hasn't all got to be about you as well. People think competitive means selfishness. Well, it doesn't. Why can't you be competitive for your watch? You know, you said there, we've got the best gym in the UK. Great. Whether it's true or not, it's bloody irrelevant. You're proud and you're passionate. Do you know what I mean? And you should be. So how did you start to steer that competitive edge in physical development and I know that may seem an obvious question but for listeners perhaps it's not because they think are we just going to the gym what, what what's competitive about that where did you manage to, to, to spark that aspect it may be through tracking my workouts okay. I think um, I think having stuff uh, written down in front of you is a fact of what you've done and, and what you haven't done that session is, yeah. is massive in that competitive edge and, and that is like so my logbook now is more than just me writing down my session it's like it's my training partner it's my competition it's what I've got to be it's, it's, it's everything really uh, it tells me a lot more than just oh you're doing this weight and this many reps today it, it tells me a lot more than that I'm glad you mentioned that because logbooks and or workout diaries or however people like to term them are starting to come up a little bit of a thing in the past I've got one and I've got a little filing cabinet in the corner of my gym where I encourage all of my clients to keep theirs because even because if they take it with them they tend to lose it so <laughs> we'll leave it there and they'll fill it in when they're yeah. here but I always tell people you know you've got to throw it onto paper so we can see that tangible progress and we can also reflect you know when you have a good day or a bad day what was different we can look back at food and other aspects like that why do you think that's and maybe you don't feel i don't know is do you feel like that's becoming less of a thing do people know what you're doing when they see you right in a book when you're in the when you're in the gym do they think it's a bit weird do you see many other people doing it do you still encourage it uh, yeah I, I definitely still encourage it i think i mean like an old-fashioned bit of pen and paper to jot down stuff in is it is pretty valuable to your training, uh, not even just for like your sets of reps, but it could be anything to do with the day. It could be the, you know, or you writing stuff down like the facility you're training at. Have you had a training partner that day? What was your pre-workout, your intro workout, your post-workout? Mm-hmm. How is that going to affect you? You can also then add how many if you received a spot in that session or or anything, any any like additional info with your session you can write down, which you can't do. On obviously you can get apps now that do similar things, but it's not as detailed and it's not as no. Just clear as just on that page and be like, well, that's And there's so much freedom and flexibility in a blank piece of paper. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. can you can yeah. really make it exactly how you need it to be. And also, I think there's something in the physical act of writing it applies and aspects of ownership because you've written it, it's yours. And I think that's one of the few places that I hope will never get. Like you said, I know there are apps and stuff out there, but they don't hold a candle to it. I think it's important that people are taking the time to physically write it and note it. And it's important. I, it feels like it's a whole process for me. Oh, you said there the word accountability I think that's massive with this because uh, as soon as you approach your set and you write down that weight that you're going to do you've got to do it it's written down now yeah. you just told yourself you're going to you can't back out and I think that's a big part of people with some in the gym sometimes is that if they haven't got that to go by mm. they go oh last week I did the 30s last week so I probably just did the 30s again then. Yeah. and then and fall into that trap every time of they either don't remember or they think it's just as easy as just going from one thing to the other. Oh, that's my mother in law. She's Hello, there to get off. <laughs> yeah, Millie, what message? She's on maternity leave at the moment. Is she? Oh, but congratulations. Today, yes, so today is her first like, keep in touch day. So I had to uh, yeah, call in the mother in law. My kids are locked under the stairs. 
But yeah. I, 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 feed, I, feed, I feed them in the afternoons. I'm joking. I'm joking, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Reset. Accountability. I was going to say, writing it down, because you said writing it down, it almost gives you the opportunity to capture the win then. Because we, we've said about accepting failure, and failure is a natural part of training sometimes. But I don't encourage people to fail every session for a couple of reasons. One, you're pretty much very, very close to injury. The margin between success and failure, injury is somewhere on that margin close to the line yeah. and if you're always going in and going for a bloody one rep max and i know that's not what you're saying but if people that do that very very likely they're going to fail on a regular basis because they're going to try and get stronger and stuff like that and despite what you think you see on youtube the biggest strongest powerlifters bodybuilders crossfit athletes are not going for pbs every single session they're not going for a one rep max the body can't tolerate that poundage constantly so when you write something down and if you, if you plan your training properly, I feel like if you plan it progressively and you use like a percentage-based scheme of strength and, and, and repetitions and stuff like that, you can set a tangible program, as I know you will do with your clients, where they can see a systematic progressive strength success and still get the win. So it will be whatever, six reps on 130. That's achievable for them because it's only 80% of their capacity and they can do that. Yeah. But if they always wanted to go, oh, well, I can do a bit more. Oh, well, I can do a bit more. And then they get the failure. It's kind of like that positive reinforcement doesn't get completed because they don't go in and go, today I was going to do 130 for six and I did 130 for six, boom. But they know it's part of a progressive plan. It's different to like you were saying before, people going in and going, oh, I did the 30s last week. I'm going to do the 30s this week. It is different. Do you know what I mean? But I, I agree with you in writing it down. How allows you to hold yourself accountable, but also allows you to capture the win. If you know it's something that's part of a plan that's going to work, you can do it and have faith that it works. Yeah, I agree. I think it works both like that before the set and after the set as well. I think once you've written it down what you've done, I think a lot of the time when people go back and they look at what they achieved the previous session, they're like, oh my God, I didn't, I did that. And then it becomes like, oh, I've got an hour lift one day to seven today because I did six last week. 100%. And it's like, well, I've done six, but I've already got the confidence that I can lift it to six and now I might be able to get seven. And it's yeah. just that constant each week that you sort of build confidence that you can handle mm. that weight for more repetitions and, mm. and yeah, just progressively the overload from there. Because sometimes weight is um, is as much of a mental barrier as it is a physical. It's like you were saying yeah. there, oh, I can do seven on this or I can do it on that. If you can do seven on 95 kilos, 100 kilos for anybody that's ever done an overhead press or a bench press or whatever, and their goal was 100 kilos, it's a big mental barrier for some people. You're like, it's two plates or yeah. 140 or 180 or 220. It's like, it's another plate. And sometimes that, just seeing it on the bar can be enough to stop people mentally. What can you speak to that about how their perceived limitations can affect what they actually end up achieving? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think when you see certain uh, weights, obviously when you unwrap them, they just feel heavy anyway. <laughs> regardless. That's and, it. Um, but, it's knowing that, but knowing that you can actually lift that weight because it's written down before you, it should give you massive confidence that you can keep uh, that you can keep lifting that weight or add more weight to that for your next exercise. I think that's a big part of it. Um, as well, the logbook does work well. Mm. It sort of forces you to keep moving forward, where I think a lot of times people do get stuck in a rut and they do a lot of the same training or the same weights, the same mm. workout every, every, every week. I think that's where a trainer to... gets so useful because it kind of takes the thinking away from you and pushes you into areas that, because it can be stressful, you know, for people and even for equally coaches. Plan yeah. training can be stressful and to try and continue to be creative or find something that challenges that individual. When we were speaking before we came on about motivation, you said about setting unrealistic goals. Can you speak around that and how you either try and channel people away from it or what is an example of, for example, an unrealistic goal that you've heard or seen or perhaps one you've set for yourself before? I think it depends on your mindset as well whether an unrealistic goal can be a good thing or a bad thing. I think quite advanced, but I think you can you can set yourself unrealistic goals and you're going to have to rise them. So I would set myself unrealistic goals with my company, for example, because I know I've got to step up and, and reach that. Mm. Like I, I said, I've said recently that, particularly about like the clothing that I said that I'd love an item of clothing to be in every fire station gym across the country. 100%. Um, for, for firefighters training across the UK, which would, which would be amazing. Pretty unrealistic at the moment, considering I'm only probably in a few stations and a few watches across those stations we're in right now. Yeah, it's unrealistic exactly. at the moment, but it's not an unrealistic exactly. goal. You know, exactly. I often say to people, no, doesn't mean no forever. It means no right now. So, you yeah. know, it's not and I think that's maybe unrealistic people, for a uh, week, but not a year. I think that's the, that's the difference that people don't always see in, in their goals, where obviously for like obviously beginners, intermediates you might have to do stepping stones to to get to that beforehand before something comes too daunting that they can't sort of realise oh, I'm never going to be able to bench press 100 kg I can only do 60 but then yeah. if you tell them well what if you improve your bench press by 1.25 kilos mm. for the next three months 
yeah. or however long it would take to get there. Well, can, can you manage that? Yeah, yeah, I could probably manage that actually. Yeah. And then that doesn't sound so daunting and say, right, you've got a bench press 100 kg. It's, it's not, it's not within the realm of possibility. You know, you, you've, you've outside the realistic part of, I can't even fathom that. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not in the realm of comprehension for me. Yeah, that's, that's a massive part of it as well. And I think well, if you get down to the reason of why they want to achieve, the yeah. reason why they start or, or wherever it is, could be if you can get to the bottom of that that's also a massive motivation for them to, mm. to drive how important is that driving force for them mm. because if that is that important they'll find a way to to make it work 100%. or they'll put in they'll put in the effort to make it work if it's not important to them it'll be like okay that might have been a you know it'd be nice it'd be quite nice if i was in shape you know I don't, I don't, <laughs> that's it it'd be quite nice be Tony Robbins talks, you know, about your shoulds and your musts, so I'm not going to pretend it's mine, but that's exactly what I hear with so many people. Yeah. I say, look, you rarely forget to pay your mortgage. Some people, paying their mortgage is a should. It's not a must. They're like, man, yeah, if I've got enough money after I bought all the crap that I want, then I'll pay my mortgage. But for most people, it is a must. But when you say something is a should, it's like you're slowly sort of massaging your mind into the realisation that it's probably not going to happen and that you're okay that it's not going to happen because it's just a should and it's not a must. And, you know, he speaks about, you know, you should all over yourself. You should lose some weight. You should save a bit of money. You should spend more time with your kids. You should spend more time with your missus. You should drink a bit less. And all of these are just shoulds. When it becomes a must, you remove the ability to decide otherwise. It's no longer a negotiable. Now, I think that's a, a key there. I think the the effort that you put in has got to has got to align with what your goal is. Yeah. Because if you're not putting the effort in and your goal is up here somewhere, that's never going to happen, is it? You never get so momentum. It, yeah, you're not you're not running fast yeah. enough. It's like, it's like you're running up to a gap and going, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, jump over this, and you're like, dude, you're still yeah. walking. You need to get a lot faster before you get to the edge. And then they get there and go, oh god, I thought I was going to reach that, and you're like, no, you didn't. You were not putting in anywhere near enough effort. Come on. Either I didn't explain it well enough or your perception of what was required was so the chasm of realisation was too big. The void was too big for us to leap across and you were going to fail. I think that's important, really. I think that's where people maybe sometimes fall down is that they decide that they want something and really they just sort of wish it rather than want it or yeah. were willing to make it, make it happen. Yeah. by putting their actions in place that they will achieve it. Absolutely. So we spoke about flexing different styles and you've done lots of different training because I know we spoke uh, about the gym there and how you have made that competitive edge a progressive thing that took you into some competitive bodybuilding and stuff like that. But I know now you, you do incorporate a lot of functional fitness, certainly with your groups and, and classes and stuff like that, which is different. Why has functional fitness become part of your routines and something that you encourage clients to do why why is that necessary why should we bother why include functional fitness at all so yeah i think it's, it's massive particularly in our role uh, to have a level of work related fitness the stuff that we have to do the awkwardness of some equipment or the awkwardness of having to get through certain gaps it's not it's not built for like a one-dimensional bodybuilder that can only do strong stuff in the gym they can't do it outside the gym or they can't crawl <laughs> through a little window because my mobility is no good that i can't get through that window now Mate, or I can't I've, I've been, that i was 23 stone yeah. when i first joined and i was struggling with rat runs and, and ba wearers and everything i was comically large yeah. <laughs> and i think that will make a massive difference so the functional fish i put in is purely so i can do i can perform better on chaps really so yeah. when i'm in when i'm in something if i've got to work hard i I know I, I know I can do it basically. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, that I'll do in my training will be using similar stuff to what we use. We're using like tires, sandbags, yeah. kegs, all kinds of things like that that are, that are awkward to lift. They're not built to be lift, okay. uh, to be lifted like, like a piece of gym equipment. Like gym equipment's got nice handles. Yes. Got nice rubber handles on you to lift. In the real world, nothing's got handles. It's all awkward um, <laughs> and you can't lift. Yeah. So, lift. So lifting stuff like that becomes a lot more challenging, even though it might be lighter than something you can do in the gym. Even for non um, uh, non service personnel like like mums, for example, you know, I mean, I know you've got you've got children and picking up your kids. Yeah, they've got arms and legs, but they haven't really got handles and they squirm around. And this is when you see you know parents throwing their backs out and hurting their shoulders and stuff like that because perhaps they've been in a gym for a long time, but they're not like you said functionally fit. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes a massive difference, really. And I said recently again, this is going back to a post I put out there a couple of days ago that. It only takes for me to have like a couple of like, arduous shouts to be like, yeah, that's, I need to do, or maybe I need to do even more. Or yeah. uh, it, justifies, it justifies why I do it in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so 
So yeah, that's it works really well. I was in combination. Uh, running across a campsite the other night, trying to find a uh, trying to find a tent that was on fire. We could see smoke that was issuing from it. And I was bimbling through bushes and I was going up and down these little berms and like uh, and hills and divots and you know my ankle was dropping left and right in my boots. And I was I was carrying like a, a Scotty backpack, which is like a hydro pack oh, okay. with fifty liters or so in it. And uh, you know, so you've got fifty kilos worth on your back. Um, running through up and down these hills, and that is that's it. One hundred percent. It wasn't until I was doing that I was like, yeah. "Wow, you know, I don't do enough of this. I've got weighted packs in the gym, but they they tend to gather dust. You know, I gravitate yeah. towards the barbells and the dumbbells. And <laughs> how much do I strap on a thirty kilo vest and start doing tire jumps? Whereas that is the stuff that you know is it can be a hell of a lot of fun as well. You know, functional fitness is is fun sometimes more than more than some of the conventional yeah. lifts. Yeah, I'd agree. I think if I was to do like cardio for, for fun, then functional fitness, that element of that, even to like CrossFit, mm. that would be my choice of, of cardio. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, like you said, the enjoyment out of it is good and the, and the variety you can use. And the fact that it crosses into strength and conditioning, uh, functional fitness, and it's good for work is sort of like a perfect like marry of the two, really. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned some, some really good core sort of fundamentals, I suppose, there when, you, when we're talking about the different aspects. But what are some of the non-negotiables? Because before we came on, you, you said several things about some really crucial non-negotiables. I tried to note some of them down, but what are some of the big non-negotiables that you have in your mind with, with health and fitness? I'll uh, say so n- number one for me, before going into any individual topic, is, is effort. 100%. It's like I said before, if, you're, if the effort doesn't match the goal, then then nothing's happening. Whether you're doing the right training, nutrition, whether you're getting the right rest, whether you're reducing your stress levels, it just, that doesn't matter. Because if you're not putting effort equally into all of those, then you're not going to progress uh, to a certain point. So if you're the relentless that's, that's enthusiast, I- then it, it makes everything a lot easier, isn't it? You know, it's, it's like an employment. Yeah. You'd rather have somebody that was relentlessly enthusiastic than somebody that appears to have all the skill sets. Like somebody that, how many times do you see somebody really gifted with strength and uh, aesthetics, but they just don't put the effort in? Where if you've got the person, and I often think this, you know, the strongest person in the world, you see world's strongest man at Christmas and stuff, the strongest person in the world has probably never been in a gym. They've probably never stepped foot anywhere like that because they're probably somewhere in a farm you know, lifting up the back end of a tractor in South Africa. You know, the people that end up on the stages are usually the people, like you've said there, who've put in the most effort. They're not genetically yeah. gifted. You know, they'll have a few genetic dispositions, but more often than not, they've put in the effort. You know, and we come back to that look analogy. So so effort is the big core pillar. Yeah, yeah I'd say so. Uh, no, I think after that, I think you can then prioritize the other ones that I just mentioned in terms of obviously then your nutrition, your training, uh, your rest and recovery, mm-hmm. and then also trying to reduce your outside stresses, your everyday life. You then have to prioritize whichever ones of those you're weakest at. And it's almost then adds like layers. So then whichever then one you need some more focus, then you've got to try and add that layer and maybe add more effort into that and so on and so on. It sort of builds from there, if that makes sense. Absolutely makes sense, man. I'm literally just, uh, I was making note on something there because there's three aspects as a member of the emergency services, which I think people struggle with the most. I'd love your input in it. And I'd also love to hear what your thoughts or what your advice to people is. Sleep. So you spoke there about sleep and recovery. Definitely, massively essential. I have been horrific at it in the past and I think there's a balance you know it's a balance there's a balance of that addict in me that just wants to keep pushing and I'm hungry and I want to get on one I want to want to want to sleep and recovery what should people yeah. be getting what is the balance do you do rest days should you rest I try to rest and then find myself under a racked barbell don't realize how I got there <laughs> in like the in like the addict coming coming to in a in a drunken stupor in an alleyway somewhere I don't know how I got here I'm, I'm just under 180 kilos and I don't know what happened yeah I was exactly the same I think one of the best things for me realizing how much rest you, you need has actually been through lockdown and that's because I've happened to have forced rest there basically and um so if we go to lockdown one this was before she um birth of the sun and um, I was training at work so the way I would train basically I would have access to the gym before and after my shifts so that give me roughly it was like five to six sessions before and after work before I would then come home and then I'd have my my full rest day so I'd train um, after my last night shift and then I'd come home and then I think would have three days at home where I wouldn't have access to the gym Okay. so it was just two I technically probably could have uh, driven in to the to the user gym on my yeah. day, but it's over, it's over an hour. We got stuff there, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to take those three rest days, 
and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to see what happens. I, I, I've still managed to train every body part at least uh, once a week. Mm. I'm going to take those three days. And yeah, we'll just see what happens. I've never had that much rest before. See what happens. And during that first lockdown, I made the best progress that I made all year. Uh, really? that. Um, and I've never really structured rest days that often to basically achieve to realise that and and that was a bit of a, a learning curve for myself that yeah. I could train almost I could train less often and having rest and I was still making crazy progress in the gym I think that was for a couple of reasons one obviously I was getting adequate right, recovery and obviously my joints were feeling amazing I was able to, able to sleep um, I was then spending uh, one of each of those rest days doing like mobility work like concentrating on each Mm. One type of move, for example. So, my, one one day I might concentrate on on squat depth. One day it might be overhead mobility. Another day it might be my hips or something like that, for example. And then mm. I come back to the gym on my first day, and I was raring to go. And I'd be so hungry to be in the gym that I never had, that I never had a bad session. Yeah. Uh, wow. So everything just, just sort of like flew from there, and I made really great progress. Probably got to the strongest I've ever been in in an off season, and that to me was like a bit of a realization. Like, oh my god, I can do more with less. Yeah. And, that's and a that, discipline that in first. itself though isn't it it's a discipline to stop first it's a discipline to start and then i'm just i'm terrible at it do you know what i mean i encourage people to take yeah. rest days but if i'm in the gym with clients on a on a daily basis and stuff outside of the pandemic i, I end up just training do you know what i mean i look in my book and i'm like yeah, uh, yeah i've had five days since the last squatted or whatever i can squat today i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that and and you just pick up niggles niggles you know yeah. is the, is the uh, forgiving term that we give to chronic injuries we've caused <laughs> through lack of self-awareness yeah. and not enough rest and recovery <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. you sort of feel like you're in a position where you're like oh, i'm never going to be 100 anyway so i might as well just try yeah 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 and also there's kind and of you fall in love with that oh god i'm a beast even though i'm hurting i'm going to get in there and do it and you're like eh, sometimes mate yeah. but it's a bit stupid sometimes yeah i was de- i was definitely like that so up until so recently i'd only put in a rest day every now and then it wasn't even scheduled it was only I'd only put in like a rest day if I actually felt back yeah. and then I'd put them in and my recovery has always been pretty good even when I was training like that but then to be forced to rest and then realise that I could still make the same progress maybe it's not better mm. has been massive and it's, that's also been great for me to learn uh, since obviously having the newborn because now I'm having to prioritise other things around that my time management's got to be better yeah so therefore, I'm having to have rest days for that as well. Mm. So now my structure, my time management and my application in the gym is now even better yeah. because of that. Mm. So new, yeah, father, like new father, operational firefighter and obviously disciplined with your physical fitness. Where does sleep fall into that? Well, when he was first born, it, it didn't. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, we, we just threw it, that one out with the right. baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Sleep went out the window. Yeah. Yeah, just cat just cat napping whenever he had a little nap throughout the day. But um, but yeah, I think routine, uh, routine and structure is a massive part of that. One for his life, and two for mine. So now we're in a, a great routine where he he seems to be sleeping really well overnight. So now I can, and, uh, and so can my missus as well, which is which is great because then you can just function during the day properly. What sort of sleep do you think people should be getting? What's realistic? I think you well eight hours would be lovely, but. A consistent eight hours would, would be great for people. I think to, to try and hit that consistently. Yeah. But I think as long as you're getting more than as long as you're getting more than six, like obviously everyone's lifestyle is different. So if you, they might be able to say, "Oh, I can't get eight hours. I can't get eight hours. Oh, okay, up at this time, that time, or whatever." But I think as long as you're getting between six and eight, and you're getting enough to still be able to progress and function uh, properly during the day. Yeah, that's it, though, isn't it? What is progress and function? Because some people are so used to operating at a lesser efficiency that they think that's the norm. Whereas realistically, they, they shouldn't be getting tired at 2, 3 p.m. You know, there shouldn't be. And I know a lot of that aspects is, is built into nutrition and it's not just their sleep habits. But how much is that? You know, I, I know we're getting to subjects here that you could take an hour and a half talking to us about anyway. But, you know, with hydration and sugar, I talk to a lot of people about, you know, their insulin response and, and how much of a factor sugar plays and how much they don't realize, you know, how much sugar is in stuff what's the day in the life of your food look like and and what are some of the big pillars you could give us in terms of what's what's going in your face i think i think the the key point with with nutrition and your own diet is more what you are able to digest rather than people sometimes are oh, you are what you eat it's more you you are what you can digest because if you're eating foods and you're having like bad bowels or you have it but then creating ibs or mm. whatever diet you have that food's no use to you it's just literally it's clear it's clearing you out it's not actually being absorbed for any any purpose at all no. so you need to find foods no matter how basic or plain they are 
foods that your body can digest and you can eat regularly throughout the day and, and feel full of energy. So I, my food is pretty basic. It's uh, no, it's not complicated. I'm quite happy to eat plain food because I know it's for a function as well. It's just rather than just taste. So I sort of fallen into that uh, mindset uh, with food. So, but also your energy stays really nice and consistent when you do that. A lot of my food is really plain. I don't, I don't have sauces and stuff like that. I'll have the, it might, yeah. might, the extent of my flavor comes from herb, spice, you know, salt, pepper, an olive oil, a squirt of lemon at the absolute yeah. limitations if I want those extra fats from calories and stuff like that. But as a result of that, my energy is lovely and, and consistent for most of the day, yeah. to be honest with you, until it naturally falls away at 8, 9 p.m. And, and, and I get up ridiculously early anyway, so I tend to go to bed quite early as well. Whereas most people, pendulum, you know, they bounce up and yeah. down the Richter scale of yeah, yeah. sugar. Yeah, you know, spikes and drops off where people are chucking in other too many like sauces or high sugar products yeah. uh, or eating food fast food and during the day they're going to be up and down throughout but I think that's a key thing for people just to get the digestion on as on point as possible and then from there they can add quantity depending on or take away depending on their goal um, which I think is quite important really. You said a really important thing about external or outside stresses and how they can play a factor in people's health and fitness. Speak to that, if you will, and, and, and an example of how it can affect somebody's ability to, to stay fit and healthy. I think it just, uh, it just literally, I think it, outdoor stresses, I think now, are probably bigger than ever, mainly due to social media, outdoor pressures, uh, obviously with lockdown, things happening as well. I think people are probably under more pressure than they've ever been to keep their companies afloat or make money, pay the mortgage, mm. uh, whichever one of those would be. Or even um, sustain a relationship. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, sustain a relationship with somebody that's driving them mad or that perhaps they feel doesn't listen to them or doesn't care about them or um, the f financial uh, balance, is that lovely word again, isn't quite where they feel it needs to be or even the, the financial or yeah. physical or emotional abuse that they're sustaining in their job or their relationship. There's, there's loads there, I suppose. Yeah. It's massive, really. And the only, the best advice I can give to, to people in those positions is to just control the controllables. Okay. What you can take, what you can take control of, you manage that the best you can, and put effort into managing that, and you will have an effect on your, a positive effect on your life. I think if you start to stress about things that you can't control, that's, that's just a never-ending uh, cycle, really, because you can't control it. Yeah. So control the things that you can, whether that's your training, your nutrition. You control the amount of hours of sleep you can, or attempt to sleep those hours, yeah. then you're going to improve your lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, you're just chasing the weather. There's, you've got no hope of ever catching it, really. So I wanted to speak to you about, firstly, size and strength. You've uh, spent time developing yourself physically when you first went to the gym. I'm not sure how relevant size and strength is anymore you know the the age of the giants of the the big magazine covers of men and women you know wanting to well certainly men wanting to be big and strong and and that was the upheld ideology of strength for a period of time is that still as relevant as it once was i've got to say it's not no uh, i think uh, i think the, the main like, role in that i think is social media to be honest I think that's probably one of the negative things that social media can have on uh, people's training and expectations, I think, is yeah. what can be achieved by not well, performing certain exercises or certain types of training. I think it also depends on your, your circles as well. Like, for example, if I was to go on my Instagram, for example, I follow a lot of high-level bodybuilders, both enhanced and natural. So you surround yourself with that way of life, of mm -hmm. what, one, people can expect, and two, the way people train. So you sort of then reflect on that as well. You sort yeah. of see, okay, that's the sort of circle that you live in. Yeah. Whereas I think with other people that are not necessarily in the fitness industry and they're looking in because they want to get into the fitness industry, they're seeing other pages that are more dominant across the industry, like all like your gym brand new clothing and, um, and more, you're more like your fashion stuff, which are putting stuff out which is maybe unrealistic to the people that want to get in. <laughs> and they're posting. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So they will think that everyone looks like this because this is the model they've chosen to use, or yeah, yeah, that's yeah. how everyone trains. He's doing some fancy workout mm. instead of doing wild classes like do the hard stuff. People would well, watch that thing. Oh god, that looks a bit hard. That's a bit daunting. Look how many plates he's got on the bar. I don't like the look of that. <laughs> but but they will like the look of someone sitting on a machine <clears throat> sideways trying to do something 
fancy. But they go, oh, that looks quite, that looks good fun. Oh, maybe I'll try that. And because the guy who's doing it's got a good quads or a good chest or whatever, they think, okay, I could probably achieve that, that, that yeah, look while yeah, doing that. Yeah. And it's like, he's having, he's, having, he's having you on, mate. What are you yeah. on? <laughs> like, yeah, and that's the age old, you know, aspect of fitness. And I think that will be continued to perpetuate this myth of the difference between functional fitness and isolation and all that sort of stuff. And we're not going to get too deep into that. But you're right in what you say about influencers and the people. I mean, even the, the larger term of influencers now in a social media market where people are influenced by what they see, what they hear, the people that they associate themselves with. You referenced about people that you watch both from the, the natural days when you used to do competitive stuff. And stuff. You, do you plan to compete again? Or- yeah, I hope, well, I'm, I'm hoping to compete this year. Okay, um, wow. I haven't, that would be my hope anyway, but I haven't <clears throat> set a date. So basically my plan would be at the moment is just to basically wait and see how coming out of lockdown affects everything really uh, and whether it would be realistic to to pick a date uh, this year or even wait till early next year. Yeah, so, I, I definitely want to compete again. That'd be great to see. I wanted to ask you because you, you said about following people in the world of fitness development for both natural and unnatural i wanted to talk to you about performance enhancing drugs and how that in my personal experiences is, is tremendously commonplace i spent the best part of five years taking a variety of performance enhancing drugs from insulin to growth hormone to steroids to viagra to all sorts of craziness now do you still see as much of it you know we've said about the death of the giants do you think it's still as commonplace or have people stepped away from it more does it is it will it forever be a uh, part of the culture I don't know yeah I do think it's a part of the industry now and I think that's that'll be the case for whether you uh, whether you class yourself as a competitive bodybuilder or whether you're just uh, a guy that goes to the gym gym, gym bro think, chest and triceps you're a gym, gym bro, if you're a gym bro. <laughs> that's it. I think if you're um, I think the last and again the last part of that I think is also due to social media because of how it's perceived that we have to look throughout the year okay so for example, if you were to follow a bodybuilder throughout the year and they're going in through their off season and they're coming in through their prep and stuff like that, the looks are very, very, very different. Mm. And it wouldn't be fashionable to post you the peak of your off season when you're out of weight. You, you can't see the outlines of your abs yeah. and you look like this, for example. To be fair, Whereas, though, mate, even in their off season, they're still taking a lot of drugs. Oh, they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, oh, yeah. For that reason, yeah. But I mean, in terms of. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. What people, people perceive they're doing, they've got to be in shape all year round. And, yeah. um, and I think the pressure that people have when they when they start the gym, I think that's more maybe why some younger guys get into it because they'll see what's being put out there on social media and they'll think that they that's not attainable to them. And so you, they might have to, they sort of come down like, maybe I will. Well, they're probably on gear. So well, maybe I'll have to take gear to look like that. Okay. And I think, I think that's sort of how the relationship sort of goes with that, uh, mm. potentially. Do you think um, it's become a, a, a lower barrier of acceptance for entry, if you will, that people are, like you say, they've, they're, it's a two-edged, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? We vilify it and, uh, you know, I've, I've been there and done it. I wouldn't encourage it. I'm glad to have come out the other end of it and I, I like to be able to speak speak about it from a position of experience. Some of it was scary. Some of it, I had no idea what I was doing, infections and yeah. having to have um, cysts scalpeled and all this sort of stuff where you bought something, you don't know what it is and you just sticking oil in your body um but it's become so commonplace it's become as you know it's, it's you know it's as accessible as creatine and protein in, in in some massive massive gyms is it something now that's stopping people from even putting in the effort without it because you know you spoke before about this instant gratification society and you know you and i starting out you know doing push-ups in the garden or when i used to do hill sprints in the park and i and i I even fell into the deep end you know what i mean i even got to a position where i was 18 and i was deadlifting 190 kilos or whatever but i was trying to compete against men in their 30s deadlifting 300 and i'm like it was just, just i can't see it's too far away i can't see the steps that get me there i know it's one kilo two kilo but it just seemed too far. And I thought that's beyond my physical potential. I need to enhance it. But also there was that aspect of, I don't want to wait. Yeah, I think that is the key. They're there, not having to wait, having having the patience to put the ears in to see results. And with weight training, it, it takes so much longer to get results than, than other types of training, like functional training, cardiovascular training. Your adaptations are pretty quick. Yeah. And, and that's why people get hooked on running because they go running. And within, within a week or so, they've improved already. You can drop you, your time fast. Yeah, exactly. So, but you don't get the same response when it comes to weight training. And, no. Uh, so therefore, it's not as rewarding to begin with. And if I take myself, for example, we said I started at 17. I'm now 33. I recently posted a picture of myself when I was 17. And then a picture when I was 33. That's, 
you got like 16 years training there. That's how long, that's how long it takes of being consistent to, to put on muscle mm. from like a, a natural point of view. Like, yeah, I could, I could probably be bigger if I knew more from the beginning as well and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think where people are coming into it, they go, I want to look like that guy now. Yeah. <laughs> then, it, yeah. then they think we can't do it now. Okay, what about next week? Well, <laughs> yeah. So then they think, okay, maybe the easy option is, yeah. is to start taking their own growth yeah. hormone or something like that to get themselves started. Yeah. And I think they'll shy away from like the hard training um, naturally for that period of time uh, I think mm. because of that so I mean we, we speak there about people taking the dive and, and, and you know doing something they perhaps at a later date regret and I can certainly look back I'm not one to say you know no regrets and all that sort of stuff but I think what it's uh, cost me in terms of finance physical limitations you know torn torn muscles damage to my glands and stuff like that stuff like that it was a big cost those awkward conversations when you sat sat with your date with your date on a friday night and it's just not working that's a difficult (laughs) a difficult conversation to have and explain that it was because i've taken too many drugs and now it's not working for some reason i think that's where it comes down to risk versus reward and and the reason why you'd actually be doing them if you're just doing them because you want to look good in a t-shirt or you want to look good on a holiday that that's that's, 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 I'd say that's not really worth. That's not really worth it. No. Like if your goal is to become a professional bodybuilder, you want to compete at a high level. Yeah. Then I think that, and you can try and then make a make a living out of that, make money out of it. And mm-hmm. that's totally different. And that's that's different. Like then, mm-hmm. then it's fair game. Do you know what I mean? That's what you've got to do to to reach that level to make money in the sport. Yeah. So how naive do you when, think some people are in terms of? Uh, top level athletes and, and you and I are not going to vilify top level athletes and Olympians and stuff like that but I think people live in a bit of a bubble when they think it's not as prolific as it is and we're not going to name any names because we, we probably don't know but certainly in for example Strongman Strongman's on uh, television every year and I think they would all be yeah. fairly comfortable I've competed against a couple of them T- Terry Hollands and uh, Mark Felix have competed against them many years ago I wouldn't claim to know them but I think they're all probably in an interview certainly I know Eddie Hall and then people like that have mentioned it and Arnie's great you know on, on Schwarzenegger speaks speak very openly and professional bodybuilders do how much do you think people live in a bubble when they think these things don't exist think that the the world is all good and unicorns and rainbows and, and everything's natural yeah I, I think that's probably the attitude of when people are on the outside looking in potentially and not knowing it I think that I think what you said there is probably the attitude where I think oh my god that's incredible what you can do mm. when obviously you might have to enhancements there to help mm. Whereas I think it doesn't the, take yeah, away from the effort, though, does it? it? Doesn't take away from the effort. No, not at all. Oh, not at all. No, and I think that's another, that's, that's another thing that I think people do. But I think that comes from within the fitness industry. So if you're in the fitness industry, and say for example you're whether well, you're natural or enhanced or whatever, it doesn't matter, and you're looking up at someone who's got a, a better physique than you or they're stronger than you, the attitude does seem to be that oh, well, I can look like that if I was on gear, and it's like, well, hang on a minute, that person probably he probably works harder than you. He's probably, his nutrition is better than you. Yeah. He's probably got better knowledge than you. Mm. So before you just write it off as one thing, whether that be, like, it could even be genetics, it could be the fact that he's on, on gear. Like, people think uh, quite quick to point the finger and be like, oh, well, he's doing this, he's doing that. Yeah, yeah. But I don't believe it. Mm. So I think it, I think it does bounce both ways. I think depending on whether you're inside or outside the fitness yeah. industry. And it's okay to vilify it because it, it is, a, is a damaging habit and uh, it can hurt people personally professionally financially and it can people can lose their jobs over it you know i i had a fear i was in the fire service when i was taking drugs and it was always it's like the worst kept secret of the job when i was in there i was this very clearly enhanced individual bumbling around on the incident ground with a head the size of a till but for people that you know for people that write it off as that one thing do you think sometimes in throwing that goal out the window they sometimes throw the effort out as well because like you say they write off the fact that that person may also work harder than them. And we're not encouraging anybody to go out and, and, and take any sort of substances. But what we are encouraging people to do is go out and put in the effort, put in the same relative effort. And only yeah. you will know that, you know, it echoes back to accountability, whether you can get in bed at night and know that you held yourself accountable to the workouts, to the nutrition that you set. Yeah, I, I think my main point of that would be, is if you're put off by that and you're saying, okay, I'm never going to achieve that because he looks like this, I'm never going to get there. You've got to follow the right people that are going to make you adhere to that. So whether that's the fact that you don't, you also know, you take with a pinch of salt maybe what those guys like that are doing and you follow, maybe you look at following more natural bodybuilders mm. and see what they're doing and see what's achievable on the natural stage. Mm. And there's some incredible natural bodybuilders out there oh, yeah. that are getting unbelievable shape. And you see that and that's motivating. You know, oh my God, like if I keep dialing down, if I keep doing this year after year, 
I could potentially get to that level maybe. Mm. Like you just don't know. So I think I think some people start, would be even surprised to hear the term natural bodybuilding <laughs> because they don't they don't call the other one unnatural bodybuilding it's just called there's called natural yeah, bodybuilding and then there's bodybuilding and you're like well if that's, if that's natural bodybuilding what's the other one what do you think it is <laughs> do you yeah. know what I mean? so there is and, and just not to get into the detail but in what you compete in the there's, there's testing is prolific and very in-depth because it's a very very gray area or potentially yeah. gray area natural bodybuilding so to keep any thought of authenticity there is a massive amount of testing that goes on in in the stuff that you do yeah of course yeah. it's got to be uh, i think for the athletes to feel like it's fair and they know they're playing they're on an even playing field uh, yeah. so to speak so I think that's important for everyone to know going into a show that you are you, you've got the same conditions as as everybody else. Mm. So you talk um, about um, keeping an even playing field and stuff. I wanted to ask you about, as a reference to, in and around mistakes and lessons learned from from mine personally, but I know you spoke before about the, the first show you ever went into. Talk to us about that if you can and, and, and how you grew as a result of your experience there. Yeah, so I definitely went into that show a bit naive, a bit underprepared and I should have sort of scouted out the, the shows beforehand and also the shows within that federation. So the first federation I competed with was the UK BFF, mm-hmm. which is an untested federation. <laughs> uh, so, so it's, like I said, it's not a, that, that wasn't a fair playing field, and you just it's not necessarily saying that everyone within those federations would, would be using, nope. but they've got the opportunity to. So therefore, you already put you already put yourself at a slight disadvantage. And I think at that point. In my training, I guess I, I probably thought I was maybe ahead of where I was. Um, I thought, okay, I could do quite well. The show gave me a good focus to push my training to the next level. So yeah. for that, it worked really well. Uh, and then when I got there, I sort of had mixed feelings about the experience of like feeling uh, whether it was the outcome was, was positive on my training. But when I was there, I was like, well, I wasn't really ready, for both sort of like physically and mentally, really. And, and it, was, it was that, and then sort of pushed me on to take, I then think I had a three year gap before I competed again. Yeah. Um, when I actually and transferred in uh, to another bodybuilding show three years later, and the difference in how I, ex- I just enjoyed the day, enjoyed the experience was was so much was so much better that I knew that I was ready for it, and I knew that this is what I want to do. I want to continue to get better at this. Yeah. Whereas the first show, I was like, mm. yeah, like I was, a bit, it was maybe a bit of a reality check oh. that <clears throat> the guys were bigger than I thought. Um, the presentation was uh, their presentation was better than I was expecting. The show was bigger than I was expecting. Do you know what I mean? All those kind of things. Yeah. When I came out of it, like, oh god, I need to sort of stuff out. Like, I don't need to do that again. I need to do. But also, you, to do you, like you say, you misjudged the situation, and you'd got into something that you didn't necessarily do enough research into. But you had the you had yeah. the self awareness to step back from it and go, okay, I thought I was entering this room where whatever people weren't allowed to wear trainers but actually i went in there and i realized i'd gone in the wrong room i i didn't overly enjoy the experience but i've got to take some responsibility and realize that i went in the wrong room and it's not that the yeah. thing the thing itself was inherently bad so you were able to uh, pivot and adapt and, and and get a great amount of fulfillment because there is a massive amount of fulfillment to be taken from that passion and from that addiction of personal development i use, I use the term addiction because i like to use the term addiction basically because a lot of people will say someone's driven or passionate or you know really really obsessive if they're doing something that's sometimes healthy but if it's something unhealthy it's, it's termed as addiction and i know you don't mind and we've said before about admitting you have a, a, an almost addictive personality but you you pour it into things that are healthy you've managed to navigate yeah. perhaps through people you're around people you've been influenced by and also your own self-awareness uh navigate around toxic addictions and be able to pour that uh, addictive personality in, in, into progress and, and and your gm and also in your business if, if you can speak around that because i suppose does that come from a competitive aspect that pours into that passion and addiction yeah, yeah i'd say it comes from that sort of like competitive personality really you're just wanting to continuously be better and just improve on some aspect, of whether no matter how small it is, whether that's going into a workout and increasing my workload by one rep or one kilo, or maybe it was just that week it was just better execution. Yeah. So I'm competitive on that side to competitive on trying to obviously drive in obviously more clients or more sales uh, with the with the clothing and stuff. That's yeah, that's a massive part of being uh, competitive, and I say I am an addict to that because yeah. it's something I couldn't live without. I think if it's something you can't live without, then you're an addict, whether it's a yeah. positive or a negative. That's, 100%. Um, I would yeah, say no, I your compass, if you know that you're not hurting yourself and you're not hurting somebody else, then it, it can be termed a healthy addiction. Yeah, definitely. And I think, yeah, people might have like negative connotations with the word addiction because, like you said, it's normally associated with 
things that are bad. Yeah. But there's a hell of a lot worse things to be addicted to mm, than, yeah. than being addicted to the gym or being addicted to progress, uh, mm. for example. So I oh, know I, I agree. I've I've sampled the other ones and they suck. <laughs> <laughs> they feel yeah. they feel they feel good for a short period of time, and then you yeah. realise it's not a mutually beneficial relationship. You end up with a real yeah. deficit in your life because it just it takes more than it gives. I wanted to ask you achievements. I mean, we've we've gone for a while there, and I'm sure anybody taking notes will have racked up a a series of life lessons and, and achievements that you've gone through there. But what are some of the things that we haven't mentioned? Mentioned because I know you have a. I, lo- I love the way you put this when you spoke about achievements and, and in the notes some of the things that you you term as achievements that perhaps people have and they don't necessarily take or they do take for granted yeah I think uh, a lot of my achievements in life have come uh, work it with alongside my wife uh, to be honest so we got married really young uh, we were 23 when we got married and uh, and then a lot of people exactly, exactly that sort of response people were like oh okay like when you mentioned that we got, we got married when we were 22 <laughs> Yeah, is, is that, I think so many people do raise their eyebrows and they're like, oh, okay, is, is that going to is that going to work? And then we're we're still together, and it's like, and I think that's a that's a big achievement because obviously it's the same as it. People doubt you when you're young, and yeah. then you stay and you stay together, and obviously it's worked. So I think that's a, that's a massive achievement because we've been through a lot of stuff together, mm. um, both like positive and negative, and a lot of our achievements we've we've done together. So now. But you know what? That that doesn't surprise me. You know, getting getting to know you a little bit better because a lot of people have got that non-committal mindset where if things get tough, you know, if something gets hard, I'm out. If a workout gets hard, I'm out. You know, if I don't get into this job first time, I'm out. Whereas you've sustained that mindset of not like you've had to push hard through a through a rubbish relationship or anything like that. But yeah. in, in any relationship, in your career, in your friends, in your family, in in a spouse, there's gonna be there's gonna be rough spots. Don't be so naive. Yeah. And you've again, obviously, had that that self awareness. You've you've matured in the way that you guys are able to to communicate with each other. That you've managed to navigate those together. And, and clearly, as I see you with you with your growing family now, it, yeah. it, it's clearly a strategy that's working well for you. Yeah, I, I think that's important as well. I think a lot of the time when people are in relationships when they're when they're younger, they often mention like about like growing apart. Uh, by the time they get a bit older, and that's why maybe the relationship didn't, didn't end well or anything like that. But I think the key for us is that we've sort of grown together at yeah. like quite a steady, at quite a steady rate. Um, where that might be from getting our first house at, at 23, yeah. uh, me getting in the fire service um, the same year, um, my wife obviously passing uh, teacher training again in the same year, and then me starting at station, her starting at her first school, the birth of our son, our second house. Well, it's all sort of like progressive with each other. Mm. That, and I'd say that's probably one of the biggest achievements, really. That's massive. Just building that. I love that. And I wanted to ask you about some of your business stuff as well, because I've been looking at some of your clothing before we came on. And... I know you don't just inherently do clothing. That's just another aspect of what you do. But how have you been able to to grow into different aspects of that? So not only the fitness, but also I know you do one to one, but you do boot camp stuff as well. Boot camps are hard. You know, I did boot camps for years. That can yeah. be a real marathon of, uh, of endurance. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's a real. It's a tough one to navigate. Yeah. How have you managed to to continue your your motivation with with something like that? I think it's just imagining that how good it could be. Yeah. Uh, I think is important. I think. When I started the boot camp, I was like setting up, slogging out heavy equipment, and I was started off getting a couple of people. I get a couple of people at like every weekend, and it was a slog. It was a slog, and I was like, "No, I've got to stick at this because I know, yeah, I know it's I know it's going to be good." Mm. And then within sort of like twelve months of that, <clears throat> I had twenty people come to the boot camp yeah. in one weekend, and. Then when you see that, you stand back and you're watching everyone go at it, using all the equipment, using the space you've set up. It's like, Feels yeah, great. it was worth it. Feels it was really worth great. it. And, and then you just, then, then my mind goes again. And I'll go, just imagine if it was like this time, or if it was up over there, or yeah, it was yeah. even bigger. There's just more dates or something like that. So I think that's the a key part of just never really being satisfied. So obviously when I started it, I wanted to get right, this needs to be 10 people. And then it's like, okay, now I've got 10 people. Now I need 20 people. Yeah. And now I've got 20 people. It's like, okay, now I need more time slots. Yeah. Now I need maybe a venue, or now I need this. Mm. So I think, yeah, I just say, just say, please, but never satisfied yeah. in terms of what I've what I've achieved, mm. and that goes through the for the business. Really, that's what keeps you motivated there. How do you balance that in your in your home life? Because 
I'm the first to admit that I can be quite difficult to be around for a long period of time because I'll constantly be asking questions like, what was the win for today? And, uh, you know, what's, <laughs> what are you looking forward to tomorrow? What was the best aspects of today? And what are you excited about for next week? And for some people, that can be very exhausting if they're not of a mindset that looks for continuous, relentless progress. Yeah, I think balance is a tough one. We mentioned it earlier, but... I don't think balance uh, does exist. Uh, I think, so if you think of like a seesaw, a seesaw, for example, all I think that would change is the pivot point. Yeah. And then it's where, what you can weigh to make a balance that you're happy with in your relationship. Uh, it's never going to be 50-50. It's always going to be going to be offset. And you just move the, the, the fulcrum across in the middle to match uh, your lifestyle. So it stays, so it looks balanced, if that makes sense. That makes perfect um, sense. I've not heard that one before, and I absolutely love yeah. it. I'm definitely going to steal yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I will ensure that was, that was Matt Fulcher. I say, you know Matt Fulcher, have you read his book? Because I know he'll end up putting a book out at some point. I'll be saying, yeah, he's the guy that came up with that, you know, the moving the fulcrum on the seesaw. It made such great sense when he said it. I, I can't do it justice. So that's a whole mindset, you know, that I love you speaking about there. And you, you've shared a number of pieces on mindset. How do you set yourself up for some of the challenges that you've got to go now because you've got a growing family is that giving you a greater level of expectation of yourself has your perspective changed at all as you look to the challenges that are still to come um yeah i do think obviously it makes you <clears throat> makes you sort of question stuff at first thinking oh my god how am i going to have time for all of this especially within the first couple of weeks of when he was born i'm thinking oh my god how are we gonna have time i've got, you, I've got time to eat to train <laughs> for him to eat and like, you know i mean you, you, you're struggling to juggle everything yeah and then uh, then once everything sort of calmed down, then that's when your your time management comes into it. Again, going back to the forced rest and how that's made me improve my training in the gym and improve my recovery. Mm. The same goes for this as well. So the days that I'm off from work and I'm not training, I'm then putting more time into obviously for my wife and son. Mm. Um, and then I know that I can go sort of guilt free to work where I'm going to be there for long hours. I'm going to be training in the gym before and after. So I'm spending a bit more time there than I normally would because I know I'm giving back at the other part of my life, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, so still sort of staying disciplined, my time management has to be, has to be better. Yeah. Because if I know that he naps at this time, that's when I've got to get my meal in or I've got to get my meal prep in. Mm. That's when I'm going to get everything sorted. And I think it just makes you you're more on point with stuff like that because you have to be because if you don't then you you, you haven't got time to get it done. So, so that that says a lot to me about working sort of smarter versus working harder. It's not just about yeah. oh god I've got to I've got to become more disciplined. I've got to become more intense. I've got to be quicker. I've got to be faster. I've got to you know pour more money or anything into it or more time. You don't you don't get any more time. Do you know what I mean? You just need to yeah. you need to be a lot smarter. And I suppose it sounds like your life has actually run smoother that approach and it's less less jarry from like the, the earlier days of masses of pre-workout and fighting the sleep and bad nutrition yeah. and trying to just train more with bad nutrition. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think it has made things better. I think if I was younger and I thought, okay, having a, <clears throat> a son is going to mean that I've got to train less. I might not get on my meals on exactly the same times I need them. I still get them in, but they're different times. And all these other things, I'm thinking, oh my God, what's that about? Whereas now, like I said, when I go back into the gym now, I'm so hungry to train yeah. that my sessions and my progress in the gym have been really, really good. And then obviously my rest and recovery has, has also been good. So therefore, I've not, not got no niggles, I've got no joint pain. Yeah. Um, I'm spending more time doing uh, mobility and mobilization stuff. So yeah, I, I think I'm saying my training has, has probably progressed again, uh, even since uh, he's been... Since he's been around, so since the the consumption of time and money and and my <laughs> my sleep has uh, has been yeah. on this earth now, and all the joy that he brings yeah. to them as well. I think some some of that as well, though. I think it's down to I, I wouldn't say necessarily proving people wrong, but I know you know, when we didn't have a son, and people were like, used to, like I was spending like twenty four seven would be my thoughts would be the, the gym. I'll be up or in the gym. I'll be playing stuff in the gym. I'll be playing clients. People would always be like, hey, you won't be able to do that when you've got a kid, you know that, mate. And know. it's almost people like, say that to me now, and then I go. I've got three kids. And they're like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And so I haven't come this far to just stop now. Like, what do you think I was going to do? Oh, I'm going to carry on. I'll just find a way. <laughs> I've got to change my priorities to yeah. still, yeah, to yeah, still yeah. improve. And I think that's, and that, that's a massive part. I think people think they have kids and I'm going, my, world, my whole world's got to change. Yeah. My priorities, my priorities might have changed order, 
Yeah. But they still all get done in the same day. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. People think you need 24 hours to continue to pursue with that goal. It's not. It's just that you used all 24 of them before because that's what was available. Now, all that's available is 10 or 12 or 16 to apply to this certain discipline. Right, well, then I'm going to pivot and adapt and get smarter and get more resourceful so that I can fit it into a narrowing gap. It doesn't mean I'm going to throw it off the table. Yeah, definitely. So people have taken so, so many, I mean, I've made a whole page worth of notes, to be fair, from some of the stuff we've spoken about today. But if there was one lasting message, sort of of an, of an overarching theme from your perseverance in the fire service, how you've balanced your physical health, what would be that one message if we had that proverbial billboard in the sky for people to see that you, perhaps you think they need to hear right now? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one there. But I think I'll probably go along the lines with that if something matters to you that much, then you will find the time, to do it, regardless of what that is. And then you need to find your why you do it. Mm. And that needs to mean something to you enough to, to change your priorities, basically. Love it. Absolutely love it. Matt, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your busy life. And uh, thank you to the mother-in-law for, uh, you know, and this is, you know, we say it, you know, your mother-in-law's been yeah. over and uh, looking after the little one, being resourceful, asking for help. Do you know what I mean? Being humble. Cool. People go, oh, I can't do it because I've got the little one. Well, can you, you know, can you get support from the people around you, people within your um, COVID bubble? Do you know what I mean? There's always a way and, and you found that way today and hopefully from the lessons you've shared, people will be able to uh, find their way and their why, no doubt. Yeah, I hope it's beneficial. I hope there's some uh, takeaways there for some people and yeah, I'd just like to thank yourself for having me on and, and chatting. And I feel like I could have chatted probably for another hour about training as well. So, uh, Mate, we could, <laughs> absolutely. And I sincerely hope that, you know, when things lift, I want to come down and we'll, we'll, do, we'll do some training together. For people that want to learn a little bit more about you or they've, they've took a nugget of information today and perhaps they want to delve deeper down the rabbit hole that is, you know, Matt Fulcher and uh, the Fitness Brigade, where can they find you? Where's the best place to get in contact? Uh, yeah, so probably Instagram would be the best place where, where my handle is at fitness.brigade so yeah you can just follow uh, DM get in, get in contact on there if you have any questions about anything I've mentioned today yeah I'll be happy to uh, buy some stuff back roger that love it brother send lots of uh, love to the family mate and I sincerely look forward to seeing you soon yeah nice one mate speak soon take care well boys and girls that was my conversation with the wonderful Matt Fulcher I told you that was not going to disappoint. What a great conversation with Matt. A massive thanks to Matt's mother-in-law for allowing us this time. Again, getting resourceful, leveraging the help of those in his inner circle. Matt's a great guy. I love listening about some of the non-negotiables in health and fitness. I'll be honest, I made some notes myself. It really reinforced things that perhaps I haven't touched base with in a long time and maybe some things that you've heard today for the first time. Once again, if you want to get in contact with Matt, all of the links will be in the episode notes just below this. So check on show more just below it and you'll find everything you need right there. If you're listening on Apple Podcast, then be sure to drop us a review. Say something nice. Really appreciate it. Really helps a lot. If you're listening in on Spotify or on one of the hosting platforms, be sure to share it. If you took a lesson from today's podcast then don't be so selfish share it with somebody else they may even thank you it may even change their life maybe this will be the podcast episode where they thought i'm going to join the fire service maybe it'll be the one where they thought i'm going to get myself in shape maybe it'll be the one where they thought i'm going to send Matt a message because it sounds really interesting who knows but if nothing more i hope this is the episode where you finish and go that was really interesting quite enjoyed that so thanks once again for going back to the firefighters podcast i do not take your time for granted i hope you took some value from today's episode if you're still listening right now chances are you did because you're hoping there's a little bit more but it's not it is over we have come to the end of the episode so i will say thank you and i will see you very soon once again right here on the firefighters podcast take it easy Thank you.